thanks for coming out today. I appreciate it. We have beautiful weather here, uh, so it's probably tough to sit in a classroom out here. And I think we're uh, in the 20s back on the East Coast. Uh, and I know a, a colleague from Massachusetts sent me a screenshot that it was one degree at home. So uh, I'm Mike Kaysani. Uh I'm at Brookdale Community College in Lincroft, New Jersey. Uh, our claim to fame has uh, uh, been uh, Bruce Springsteen and John Bon Jovi for many years, and now it's uh, Hurricane Sandy because we were uh, uh, affected by that quite a bit. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, an NSF funded project that uh, that we just started. So this one was funded October 1st, and so we've only had really uh, uh, a couple months of work so far, and uh, just hiring people in the college bureaucracy to get started on the project took uh, took those two months. But uh, I'll fill you in a little bit on what the project is doing and show you some of the things that we're working on. So it's eMate. Uh, ebooks and mobile apps for technician education. And again, please stop me if you have any questions uh, as I'm going through this. Uh, this is um, a little screenshot I grabbed here. So this is, uh, again, we've only been at it two weeks, but uh, this is a, a, an author posted this. But uh, again, should I talk about the book? Should I think about the book? Are you writing the book? Yes, no. And again, the, the, the outcome for, for me is just shut up and write the book. So, you know, we have to move forward. We've got to get going on this stuff. No, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, this, this one's not related, but I just thought this was very strange and, and, uh, and, and wanted to share it with you. So who knew that there are still people playing classic Tetris on the, these Nintendo NES systems? So this is the... 2012 Classic Tetris World Championship, and so these these people are all lined up there competing against one another in Tetris. Right? And so there's a whole underground of uh, Tetris players. All right, so we're going to talk about books primarily today, and this is something I found uh, yesterday as I was going through some of this stuff. So somebody referred to a book as a bio-optic organizers of knowledge, and when I've talked about ebooks, one of the things that, that, that really sort of uh, has frustrated me is I think that the, the, the term book is a misnomer because I think that, that these can be so much more than that and that when you, even using the term ebook or electronic book, you sort of limit what, what these things can do and what they can be. Right. So part of this project really stemmed out of looking at our students. So we looked at our students and what they're doing, so they're all bringing their mobile devices uh, to campus. I was talking with somebody here before the presentation started, and they were talking about how they have a brand new facility, and uh, somehow they, w they went green to the point that they have no power anywhere. So the students can't plug in their computers or their laptops or their uh, mobile devices anywhere, but they're, so they're very green. But uh, what we're finding on our campus, and I would suspect on virtually any campus is this, this bring your own device to work movement is happening at, at college campuses where students are showing up with their laptops, with their tablets, with their smartphones, and so we have to be ready for that uh, uh, hit on our networks, but we also have to engage the students with these devices, and that's, that's the approach that we're taking. So this is... Uh, what we've typically done with students, we give them books and we expect them to go home and lug those books around and read those books. And I've been at, uh, at Brookdale, uh, this is my 16th year, and in the last couple of years I've just noticed that uh, students show up the next week for class. I said, you know, read this chapter, we're going to have a quiz on this chapter. They come in, haven't looked at the chapter, haven't read the chapter. Some of them didn't even bother buying the book. And they just think that, well, it's a quiz. I can finagle my way through it, and I'm going to be able to get a, you know, seven, eight out of ten right, you know, if I need to. So, so there's this real lack of engagement when it comes to these textbooks, and and we're trying to understand why that is. I have one student, a uh, nice kid. His first name is Light, uh, L-I-G-H-T, like a light bulb. But uh, he's taken three classes in my department, and I found out he didn't buy the book for any one of his three classes, and it was primarily money. All right, so the books are $180, $200, and, and he would rather pay for the tuition and try to wing it in the classes than, than try to do this. 
I have another student, uh, I won't use his name, but I call him the, the textbook whisperer. So he's been the student that everybody else goes to in the class. So once they find out the ISBN number of the book, they give it to him. He goes on to some site. I don't even want to know where he goes. And within 10 minutes, he's got a PDF of the book, and he's got it on a thumb drive, and he's passing it around to the class. All right, so this idea that the publishers have figured out how to protect their content, you know, they, they, they don't have it figured out. And I understand in Japan, uh, it's fairly common in Japan where, where people will just take their textbooks, they'll cut the spine off, just feed it through a scanner, and then uh, make a PDF of textbooks uh, all the time. All right. And sell it, yes. All right. Now, this was interesting. We've all heard about the higher ed bubble. We've heard about the, the housing bubble. So this is some data. So it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census Bureau. So if you look at these, uh, these four lines, this, uh, this is from 1978 to uh, 2012. This uh, dark red line over here is the Consumer Price Index. So that's the, the flattest of the four. The yellow line, which is, is the new home prices. And that one, we know there's been a, a housing bubble, and we've seen that happen. And we also know health care. Look at the red line. That's what's been happening to health care since uh, in the last 30 years or so. But look at what happened to educational books, textbooks. Right? So, so right under our eyes, we've seen this sort of bubble. And uh, the person who posted this, I have a link in the presentation, uh, basically felt that what's going to hurt, uh, what's going to end that bubble or burst that bubble is uh, uh, something like what happened with encyclopedias and Wikipedia. So they're suggesting that the open book movement is, is what's going what's to burst that bubble. But uh, I think it's bursting already just because the students don't buy the books or they find ways to, to pirate it. They get, a, they get around the price of the book. Even the, uh, uh, the used book uh, is, is, is a, uh, you know, on our campus, uh, they, they, you know, we teach technology in my department, but on my campus, the bookstore keep, tries to uh, have a restriction that you have to adopt a book and keep it for two years. And so I try to explain to them, well, some of my stuff is changing faster than two years. If I keep a textbook for two years, it's worthless. And they say, well, but we need to be able to buy the used books back and then sell them back to the students. So, so it's, it's, it's a whole different model there. All right. So let's talk a little bit about e-books. So this is a, a survey that, uh, that, I'm, that I have, again, a link to here. But 51% uh, of students bring a laptop to class. 39% uh, are likely to bring a print textbook to class. I, I would say, in, in my experience, it's less than 39%. I would say out of a class of 20, maybe three have the, the book, which is about 15%. Now, what's interesting is most of these students will use the laptop, their phone, and e-reader to study. So they'll use that, that tool, that technology, to study but most kids are still not buying digital textbooks. And one of the things I think that, that is the reason is I think it's still a price issue. The, the publishers haven't figured out that if you're going to sell something that's ones and zeros, that's bits floating through the air, you don't need to charge the same price you would charge for a print textbook, a paper textbook that has to be warehoused, has to be shipped, uh, and, and all the associated costs with that. So, so I think that's one of the things holding back uh, digital textbooks, the publishers themselves. And I, I think that's part of that is their reluctance to let go of that, that cash cow, that model that, the, again, you saw the that, price. The, uh, the price. The price on the digital books are, yeah. uh, they're, they're no, when you're what, 20% off or something. They're not, yeah, they not they're not where they should be. Right, right. And anyone who's an author can tell you that the royalties authors get don't come out of that price that they're charging. All right, so this is uh, a little word cloud of our project. And so, again, our focus uh, is a lot on students. It's on getting the content from the content creators rather than, uh, than, than from the publisher, uh, focusing on mobile devices. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these. Uh, this word framework shows up a lot because we're, we're we're, uh, we're focusing on making something that's generic that can be used uh, for any type of content. All right. So 
currently what we're doing, this is a three-year National Science Foundation ATE project. So the first year of the project, we're really focused on what we're calling first-generation e-books. And that's really almost getting the content into an e-book format. Right, so just where it's available as an e-book, uh, primarily for mobile devices, but also for laptops and desktops. And it's interesting now because I don't even think of a laptop as a mobile device anymore. Right? It, uh, my, my wife uh, will tell you, when we, we took our daughter uh, to buy a new Apple computer, she started college in, in September. So in the summer, we took her and bought her a, a nice MacBook Pro. And, uh, and she, said, she turns to me and says, uh, so, Dad, what kind of laptop did you have when you were in school? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a, main a mainframe. Yeah, it's very portable. All right. Uh, all right. But so, so the approach we're taking is to take the content we have, build first-generation e-books, and, and again, that's really just the, the book itself, and then now start to add interactive elements, video, audio, multimedia, and build second generation ebooks. And then the third iteration, the third generation, we start to then build mobile apps. So, so not necessarily the whole book is a mobile app, but then you start to see some of the pieces of the book become mobile apps. And I talked about that framework idea here. And so the idea is that we document all of this and have materials in place, support materials, templates, all sorts of materials so that anybody can go to our site and basically get enough material that they can create their own ebooks, their own mobile and web-based applications. So the three content areas, what, what we've done for this project we actually, in the project, I think we said we're going to do two content areas, but we actually have three. So we have content in networking that's already written, content in electronics, and then content in math. So these are all already existing content from authors who are sharing it with us and allowing us to publish it as ebooks. Right? And what we're doing as we do this is documenting the whole process, and then the, the real deliverable for the project is going to be that framework that then somebody can take and build their own content into an ebook. All right, so a little bit about the, the first generation and second generation, which is what I'm going to focus on today. The first generation, I, I have a 10th grade textbook with a publisher and they wanted to get it into the state of Texas. Texas requires that you have it available as an ebook in Texas in order to be adopted by the high schools in Texas. And Texas and California are the big markets if you have a textbook. If you can get it adopted at the K through twelve level, you have a big audience. Well, the publisher what they said was, well, if we put it out as a PDF, that qualifies as an ebook and then we've met their requirements. So that was that was all they felt we needed to do. So basically, there's a PDF copy of the textbook that people in Texas can get. Right? Now, what we're focused on, on for this first generation is make it av available in a web format. So both, uh, we're looking at HTML5, which is an emerging web technology, and also Flash, which is a more legacy technology, but make it available for web-based devices. And that's to meet the market of not everybody's going to walk into a classroom or into a school with a laptop or some sort of other mobile device so they can still view it here on a desktop computer or a laptop computer. We're also going to publish it as EPUB. EPUB is a standard, uh, uh, an open standard. It works on Apple devices and a variety of other devices. It's probably the most widely supported uh, uh, book. Uh, ebook format. Mobi is a, is a format that will work on Kindle and other devices. And then this uh, AZW, this is Amazon's Kindle only format. That's proprietary to Kindle. So that's sort of the first generation ebook in those platforms. And then second generation, the difference between second generation is now where we start to add in the interactive elements. So still deliver it in web. So HTML5 and Flash. Uh, now iBooks. iBooks is Apple's proprietary format for interactive eBooks. So that's going to be ISO only. So it's only going to be Apple devices that, that can see that, and only iPhones and iPads. There's not a reader for a laptop or a desktop. 
And then also, Kindle has their own format. They call it KF8, Kindle Format 8. And that one also supports multimedia, audio, video, and interactive elements. And it's, these are both very, uh, if you look at the file format, there's a lot of HTML, XML, so it, it, it's a very web-centric sort of programming. Now, one question has come up from our authors. So our goal is to make everything available cheaply or free. Right? But we're leaving it up to the content owners. All right, so if an author says, well, I want to charge for my book, we're leaving it up to them. And we will have the resources in place and information about how to publish it to one of the ebook stores if they want to do that. And the question has come up, well, I want DRM. All right, DRM is digital rights management. So some authors want their books protected with DRM, some don't. And so we're, we're basically agnostic about it. We're not going to, uh, I would prefer personally everything open. All right, no DRM on it. If they want to put the book anywhere, anybody can download it. Put it up there for $5. Let people download it for $5 and, and make it with no DRM. So if they want to give a copy to their friend, they can give a copy to their friend. I hate to break it to most authors, but they're already doing it. I just uh, I read an article on the, coming on the plane about uh, you know, the title of the article was How to Break Amazon's DRM, you know, so you can share the Amazon books, the Kindle books that you buy. So. The kids know how to do it, and they can do it probably faster than we can figure out how to stop them. All right, and I think Sam, Sam Brown is teaching uh, one of his uh, hacking workshops right now. So, so uh, all right. Now, some of the some of the tools we can talk about. So, on a uh, on a Mac, you can use Pages. So, Pages is a nice application. It's, it's essentially Apple's equivalent of Microsoft Word, but it exports directly to EPUB, which is that format I talked about, the uh, EPUB 3.0 is the current specification. Microsoft Word is another tool. So, uh, most of the e content that we have, the, the content that we have right now is in Word. There's one author who uh, we had a conference call with him uh, a couple weeks ago, and his content, he, uh, he said, well, what format is your content in? Oh, it's handwritten. And I said, well, how, you know, how many pages? Oh, well, it's on uh, legal pads. How many legal pads? Oh, about 15. All right. Said, so, so how are we going to get that uh, so that we can use it? You know, I, 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 like, I do like the idea of a handwritten book. We just put it up there as a PDF of all his handwritten notes, and that's the book. But uh, no, we're going to have to find some way to get it into Microsoft Word. But, so that seems to be the most common way people actually create these, uh, these documents or their content. Calibre, there's some other tools like this, and so we'll have information and links on how to use Calibre and some other tools. So these are some open source tools for creating and modifying ebooks. Calibre is probably one of the most popular ones. And then iBooks Author is one of the ones that I'll focus on today. Right? And this is an Apple product. It's free, but it only runs on Apple computers. Uh, and uh, there's some widgets we'll talk about, so there's a variety of different ways we can make widgets, and that's where we start to get into the interactivity. All right, the third part of the project, the, the third generation, is where we start to talk about mobile apps. And so for mobile apps, uh, we're going to focus on iOS, so the Apple devices, Android. The Android we're still focusing on now because there are plenty of readers on Android that will read EPUB or Mobi. So, so the books we develop will be able to be read on Android devices. And then also HTML5 because, as I said, HTML5 is a web technology. So with just a mobile device and a web browser, that ebook is available. This is a chart here, a survey of developers and what programming languages they're using. And just to give you a sense here, the, the uh, iOS is Objective C, so so th so that's the sort of programming you would have to do there, and then you have Android is a Java-based development environment over here, so it's a little bit more involved there. There are some tools that that are emerging to try to streamline some of that de mobile app development. Uh, one of the ones that we're looking at is the Adobe Creative Suite. So Adobe Creative Suite, you build it in Adobe Creative Suite and then you can actually push it out to all these formats. So Flash, HTML5, an Android app, or a Apple app. Right? So that's, that's one technology that we're looking at. All right. 
So a little bit about iBooks Author. This is what iBooks Author looks like. So this is, again, looks like desktop publishing here, but you're actually building a book uh, page by page and chapter by chapter. Uh, it works very nicely uh, for one of the books we've started working on. You can just import it chapter by chapter. So if you have a chapter as a Word document, you just bring it into iBooks Author. It comes in as a chapter. And then one of the things here, you notice there's text tools, shapes, tables, charts, and then these widgets. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these widgets. So th these are the nine widgets that are included here, and I'll show you some examples of those. But it's a very nice tool, and I'll, I'll show you uh, some samples from that. Now, when this tool was released about uh, probably about 18 months ago now, 16, 18 months, they had a press conference uh, uh, and talked about education and their focus on education, the licensing that they put for iBooks Author wasn't clear. And so a lot of people read the licensing to mean that if you use iBooks Author, Apple owns your content. And then you couldn't do anything else with that content. If you sold it with Apple, you couldn't do anything else with it. Uh, they've clarified that. And so this is actually language from their FAQ, their Frequently Asked Questions. And what it says, if there's a fee charge for the work and it's in the iBooks format. So the iBooks format is what? That's the format for an Apple device. It's not going to work on a Kindle. It's not going to work on a laptop, a desktop. It's not going to work on any other device except for an Apple device. Then the work can only be sold through the iBooks store. So basically, they I mean, if you're going to create a book for iBooks that has these interactive elements, you can only sell it through their iBooks store. But again, that book is not going to work on any other device anyway. So, so it, it, it's not really a restriction. It turns out, if you're giving it away for free, you can then just distribute it. You don't have to. You could put it in your learning management system. You could put it on your website and give it away for free. Right? But if you're going to charge for it, you have to do it through their bookstore, and they take their 30% 30, uh, 30 cut. Right? If it's in a different format, so I, uh, iBooks Author can also export as PDF and EPUB. Remember I mentioned EPUB is an open format. Then that restriction doesn't apply. So the same book you build in there and publish as an interactive book, you can also publish as an EPUB book. And then you can do whatever you want with it. You can give it away. You can put it in another bookstore. Yes? No. No. No, it doesn't. Right? So that's, again, that's what they're locking you into their devices and to their format there, but it has the interactivity. The EPUB 3 does have some multimedia. So EPUB 3 will support audio and video, uh, some HTML widgets, but not, not to the degree that the uh, iBooks format does. So the iBooks format is sort of like a, uh, the EPUB 3 on, on steroids. All right. So a little bit about some of the widgets here. So this is one of the widgets over here. This is the gallery widget. And this is just a widget where you take and you find a bunch of photos. So I took some, uh, we have a, a little cabling exercise that we do with the students where we give them some pictures of cables and they have to spend the, 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 the homework is to go and identify the, ca the type of cabling, what speeds it supports, the connector type and various things about it. But you just drag and drop the different uh, photos of these different types of cablings right onto here. And you can build this gallery. And so let me show you here what that looks like if I can. That's a different one. And let's see if I can do this here. All right, so what I'm doing here is uh, all, the, all of the iPads except for the first generation the iPads support what's called AirPlay, which is an Apple protocol where you can actually uh, take what you're doing on the device and you can stream it to a, uh, a TV or some sort of device. So I'm using AirPlay on here. So you're actually seeing my iPad over here. Right? And if I go to an example book I have over here, and this book, uh, I just built this quickly. Uh, Actually, on the plane, I did most of this. But let me just show you some examples here. So this is, when you, when you start the bookstore here, I just picked one of the sample templates here. So this is just the template. I didn't give it a cover. I didn't give it a name. But this is what it looks like in, the, in iBooks. 
And so if I just click there to launch that chapter, I can just swipe to the next page over here. And this is all just uh, filler text or placeholder text. And just wanted to show you some of these. So let's go to that one that I just showed you, which is the gallery. I can find it here. So this is the gallery over here. And if I just take that and I pinch on it, all right, it goes full screen here. I used, uh, the pictures were small because they're just from a Word document that we use. But you can now, a student can swipe here and they can go through these and examine these different, uh, different ones. And then you could even have in the captions, you could have the information about each one as they're learning about them. Uh, you can also write in line here. You don't even have to be full screen like that. So the vision here is that the books are going to have these sort of interactive elements. So you might have a pane of text over here where you're explaining the concept. And then this interactive element over here, for the example, this gallery, could then be there to support that text content, right? where they're just sliding through and looking at these different tables. Okay. Uh, AirPlay is the protocol. So that, that's just uh, built into these devices. I'm using a, an app on my, um, on my Mac, which is called AirServer. So AirServer allows you to stream on a, over a wireless network from an iPad. Uh, on our campus, we're experimenting with Apple TV. So we're plugging Apple TVs into the projector. So Apple TV is a little $99 box that you can buy from Apple, plugs into a TV. We're plugging it into a projector. And now faculty, so English faculty are really excited about it. So they're walking around with book, literature books and they're highlighting pieces of it and having their students look at it on a big screen. And they're just walking around with an iPad. So, so uh, if, if you're interested in that setup, I can fill you in on what we do with that. We use a little uh, uh, a, uh, HDMI to VGA adapter to be able to do that because uh, there are not many projectors at our campus that are HDMI, that have HDMI inputs. All right, let me go back to the presentation. And we'll switch back and forth between these. I have the I've done the whole presentation from the iPad, but I don't know why I chose not to. This is this is more dramatic. Okay, okay, okay. So that's that gallery. Let me show you a couple more examples. So this is this is just a um, the media. So this one is just very simple. This is if you want to drop an audio file or a video file into an ebook. And all of this is customizable. You can change the background colors on these widgets. You can change whether or not the caption is above or below, whether or not you have the, the, the title, whether any of that's displayed or not. So this is just a video that shows up in there. I'll show you what that looks like in the, uh, in the book. This is the, the uh, assessment or the little quizzing one. So you can create a series of quizzes, interactive quizzes that they can go through. And so that's just one of their standard widgets. And with this, create as many questions as you like. And they, they check the answer. And then they, they hit it, and it's saved with their book. They can come back, and they can reset it again if they want to. But again, imagine rather than having an end of chapter questions or end of unit questions, you have a, a pane of text the student is reading. And right there next to it, they can check their understanding right there. And if they miss something, they can go back right to the text. They don't, they don't have to jump out to an, uh, you imagine even in a learning management system, you, you go and you study your stuff in a learning management system. Then you go to another folder, click on a quiz. You go take a quiz. You, you're unsure about the quiz. Then you go back to the content, look at the content again, or go back to a physical book and look at that. Well, what if it's all there together and it's in context? You read the content, and then you, you take the quiz. Do the 1980s? Okay. Nova. Is that part of the Nova online? A Pearson product. Okay. All right. This is uh, Keynote. So Keynote is Apple's equivalent. I'm actually presenting with Keynote here, but this is their equivalent of PowerPoint. Uh, and, and it's actually a much nicer product than PowerPoint, much more robust. But uh, uh, you can actually embed a keynote presentation in a book. So again, a lot of us are using presentations or some form of a presentation. So we can actually embed it right in a book. And let me just show you here. One of the things you can do, so for example, this is, I have this a couple different ways in the ebook. This is just a little. Uh, Keynote presentation on the IP version 6 protocol header. And 
what I've done is just taken these slides and then made these into hyperlinks. So this is this button is just a hyperlink. I click on that, it just goes to this. If I click on this, that's another hyperlink that jumps to a description. I click back, back here, jumps to there. So all I've done is used the, a tool we use in classroom every day, PowerPoint or Keynote, but again, almost identical in how they work, and just use that to build interactive content. Right. And again, I think that's something that's very uh, approachable for most people. So if you look at what it is, basically, it's just a PowerPoint presentation or a keynote presentation with just the slides and they're linked together with these hyperlinks. Right, so that's, that's very simple to do. And now if I show you that, and let's see, let's show you a couple more here. All right, so let's go here. And by the way, the, to get to Air Server, if you have the, if you, or AirPlay, if you have AirPlay running, you just double click the home button on an Apple device, you swipe, and you get this little icon over here. And that's the AirPlay icon. You click on that, and you'll see I have the choice of what device to stream to and whether or not I want to mirror the device. You can also have the sound stream as well. So I mean, if you have audio in, in what you're using, you can do that as well. All right, so let's go back to my book here. Let's see. And which one were we on? Let's see. All right, let's show you some examples over here. So, the um, so this is this is an actual presentation I actually did uh, in Philadelphia a few years ago. So this presentation is just embedded in here. I can go full screen, or I can click like this. And I can go through the slides just by tapping my finger here or swiping. And so a student could just go through the slides. And let's see if I don't know if this one. If there's an embedded video, the embedded video will play. So if there's a video in the presentation, that will actually play right, right here on the iPad. And as I said, you can do it like that, or you can go full screen like this. And, all right, I won't go take you through the whole presentation. And this is just that IP version 6. So I built that interactive uh, element in Keynote, with just a simple presentation, and just embedded it in there. And let's see, that's the actual presentation there. And then here's a quiz. I didn't add any other questions here, but I, I think A is the right answer here. So if I just click check answer here, it shows me. You know, the correct answer is not B. Okay. Right. But the goal of the project is to have materials, information about doing all of this stuff. So we've already started filming a little video that takes you through iBooks author and explains a lot of what I'm explaining here in more detail. Let's see what watch the time here. All right, so that's the keynote. I want to get through a couple more of these. All right, now this one is interesting. This one is an interactive image, and so I'll go back and show you this. So this is a, a screenshot of an, or a picture of an oscilloscope, and so you want to teach someone how to use an oscilloscope. You can label these dials, and then when they click on these little labels here, it will zoom in to that portion of it. And you can have an explanation there of, of how to, what that dial does or how to how to how to use that dial. This one, and we have some resources in addition to uh, teaching networking. I also put I also built a CAD program when I got to the college, and I was responsible for uh, developing a rendering and animation course. And so I, I I've taught. Um, I've taught uh, courses in rendering and animation, 3D rendering. So this is a little network card, and so it's a 3D model. And so you can actually, a student with their finger could take this model and rotate it around. And so this one, uh, anybody use Google SketchUp? So Google SketchUp is a free Google product that you can go and you can build little 3D models. And then they have a whole warehouse of free 3D models that you can download buildings, 
uh, uh, humans, animals, uh, objects like this. So this is just a model that I downloaded from the warehouse, export it into the right format, and then you just drop it into the iBook. And so you imagine, same thing, you have text on one side, and then you have a little 3D model. So imagine you're teaching biology, or you're teaching anatomy and physiology, and then you can have a, a portion of the body in somebody, or an organ, and somebody can rotate it around and interact with it while they're reading about it. The, oh, the oscilloscope, I should do that one while we're there. Again, that one's fairly straightforward. You just click on this, and you can determine how much it's going to zoom. You can put in the text, click on it again, it zooms out. Very easy to do. I, I put this whole thing together, all the elements, I built them in the last two days. All right, so, the, so that's how easy this is to do. It's not, it's, it's not rocket science. Now, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, you know, why would we do this? And let me show you one of the reasons why I've taken this approach. I have a books folder here somewhere. I'm teaching a Windows 7 course. 3D rendering and animation, Windows 7, right? they're all the same, the same thing. Uh, and so I'm using the publisher's ebook. So this is their Windows 7 book. Actually, this is a different one. But let me go to the Windows 7 book here. Let's see if I have it. Yep, there it is. And if you look at this, this is what the publisher gives you as an ebook. Right? You can zoom in, you can pinch and zoom in, but there's no interactive elements. If you want to highlight something, let me show you highlighting. Let's see, let's uh, jump ahead here. Oh, here I'll, if, if I want to highlight something, I click this little pencil, I draw this rectangle around it, and click highlight. All right, because again, that whole rectangle was very important. All right not just a piece of it. But the publisher, the publisher who has m many more resources than I do, this is, this is the kind of things they push out. And so part of the reason we're moving in this direction is just the frustration, number one, with the pricing that you get from the publishers. Because if a student wants to pay for this, they can rent this now from the publisher, by the way. So they, they, they don't even get to keep it. They can rent it from the publisher or they can buy it. They're not, they're not cheap either way. But there's really not a lot of interactivity here. Um, and if you look, go back to my version, when they raise the price, yes. Uh, if you go back to my to my example over here, and oh, and the funny thing is, uh, you know, as faculty, we get examination copies and desk copies all the time. We're used to that. Well, this is this is a desk copy because we've adopted that book. And then I'll be home one night, you know, preparing for my class, looking over, looking over the chapter, just making sure I, I, I got everything down. And then it'll, it'll say the book is no longer available from your bookshelf. So then I have to go to a computer, I have to log into their website, and I have to renew my, my subscription to the book. This is a book I'm using. This is a book I've adopted. And so here, if I want to highlight something, I can just drag my finger across like this, highlight it like that. Okay. And let's pick a word here. And here, if I double click on a word, I can actually, there's an inline dictionary. I can, if, if there's a definition there, all right, that, this is all Latin, I think, so there's not going to be any definitions here. So that's the drawback of using this text. But you can define it. You can, it, it'll, it'll look it up in Wikipedia if there's a Wikipedia entry. You can add a note. As I said, you can highlight it. You can copy it. You can share it all from here, all right? None, none, Nothing close to that in, in the publisher's content. And let's see here. All right. Um, let's see. How are we doing on time? We're almost done. All right, let me show you a couple more interactive elements. This one is nice. Now, one of the things when I started working on one of the books, I was, I was a bit challenged because the author had these, it, it, it's a book that's been published as a print book, so he had these little inset boxes where he had additional information or related information, and I couldn't figure out an easy way to do it. Well, on an update, they added this little widget here, so this little widget is this scrolling box here, so I could just insert this on a page, and then the rest of the text would be around it, but this would be here, and you could have this figure and information in here, 
this is a little pop-up over here. If you click on the picture, it just pops up whatever text you have in there. So in this case, I just took the description about uh, Marconi from uh, Wikipedia. All right, we've seen those. Uh, this is this is another one that uh, for the math book is going to come in handy, probably for all of our technology books. This one is a I'm rotating my device here. I've got to be careful. This is a scientific calculator. All right, so right in the book they can have a scientific calculator. You can give them a little exercise and then say go do the calculation, and the calculation is saved there. Notice I did a couple calculations that saved there, so they can go back and look at it. It has memory, so you can store different values here, and then they, there's a little pencil where they can make annotations about the different values and store that information there. So again, just a calculator built right into their book. This is a little exercise I do on collision domains and uh, broadcast domains. And so let me erase the notation there. So I do this in class with the students. What I have them do is take this little topology that I've drawn and identify how many collision domains there are, how many broadcast domains there are. And I do it with them. I, I show them with a paper and pencil uh, doing it in color. But here you could just take and, for example, with their finger they can go and start to circle all of the, uh, that looks like that's a collision domain. And they could just circle them and count them as they're doing this. So right on the iPad and it's stored on here. When they're done, they can go back to this and it'll be here. And I haven't set this up for this one, but this one you can actually, the, the student can actually submit it to you. So they can uh, submit the assignment right from the book. It's still in iBooks. Yeah. So they just type their name, type your email address, and it sends it to you. Just want to make sure I hit on all of them before we. All right, this one, this is a, just a little whiteboard widget. So if you just uh, want to have them sketch out something, all right, so let's say you're teaching a wireless course and I want you to sketch out the floor plan and I want you to describe to me where you think you might put the access point. So right in the center of the room is usually good. But they can do that and that's saved. This one, more like a game here, but I so I took uh, a word bank that I use with a course, and I just uh, took those words and created a little word search here. So again, something that one of the key things with all of our courses is learning nomenclature, ner le learning terminology. So rather than giving them, I give them study guides that have pages and pages of words with their definitions. All right, what if what if you they learn the words this way? All right, so. Um, you can, oh, I see dicey here. Dicey wasn't one of my words, but I see it there. Okay. All right. All right. All right. This presentation is getting dicey. Okay. You know, you always have to use it in a sentence. Um, let's see. I showed you that one. The quiz, the, the video. Again, you can do it. You can play it right in line there like that. You don't even have to make it full screen. So, uh, one of the, one of our partners is Pellet Productions in Massachusetts. They're a video production company. They did ATE TV, so they have a whole library of videos that, that they filmed with the whole technology community and technology educators. So imagine you have a book, and then at the end of the chapter, you have a little video about careers that the students can watch right in the book. Okay, this one is just a widget for Wikipedia where you can actually embed a whole Wikipedia entry right in here. Right. Right. I always do Marconi because Marconi is easy to find. Okay. Did you want to have a case with Tesla? Yeah, yeah. That one is real time. So that, that's, that's the actual Wikipedia page. This one is uh, this one is another uh, little uh, whiteboard app, but this one is a split screen, so it gives you the opportunity to have a figure over here, and then so then in this one, this is the uh, the nerd Venn or the geek Venn diagram. So basically, uh, the blue is intelligence, the uh, purple is social ineptitude, and the yellow uh, the yellow is obsession. So depending on what levels of obsession or uh, or intelligence and social ineptitudes you have tells you what kind of uh, what kind of geek you are. So, so if you have all three of them, you're a full-blown nerd. 
Okay. Yes. Oh, this this is a particular. I, I, um, it, it's in the presentation, but this is a, a widget tool that that uh, that is a third party tool that allows you to build these widgets. And and the advantage of some of these widgets are some of these widgets are HTML5, which which can then re be repurposed to use in other types of ebooks, so they don't have to be limited to the iBooks. And that's that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on some of these uh, web-based or HTML5 uh, widgets. It, it uh, they have they have different licensing. So most most of them, um, uh, let's see, I can give you this one is this one's uh, I think from Bookery, so I can show you the pricing there. Let's see. Five minutes. Okay. So that that one is uh, bookery.com. And so we're we're just in the process of evaluating these, and that's the, so there there are other ones that are emerging all the time. But um, one of the things that our site will be is then a resource to learn about these different types, what the pricing is, what if there's educational discounts available, and so on. But um, let's see. I don't see the pricing handy right here, but I know that uh, some of them they charge per book, some of them charge a, a site license, so it'll vary from uh, from site to site. But uh, if you come, uh, uh, when we do a break, I can go through it with you. Yeah, I mean that's what our project is for: is to, to help authors uh, get their books in this format. So. Um, let me just go to my last slide here so we can finish up here and then I'll take any questions. So that's the sliding bar. That's the, uh, this, this one, again, this is HTML. This is one of the widgets is an HTML widget. And so that's, these widgets are probably the most attractive because these will work in any format. So they'll work on the web, they'll work in the Kindle, uh, Kindle format 8. So that's, this is a little uh, application I use to build that one. So this is an application called Hype. So it's uh, uh, I think about fifty dollars, and you can build these scenes and then timelines like this. And because I teach rendering and animation, this is very familiar to me. This sort of approach, but but you can basically build these fairly rich interactive elements. Moonbase is an, a web-based one that allows you to build uh, HTML5. Book widgets is another one. So they have. Uh, a little graphing uh, a plot where you can uh, plot something, frame sequence, flashcards, quizzing. The uh, bookery is the one I just showed you. So this is the variety of different uh, types of widgets that they have. All right. And I'll stop there. That's that's uh, again that's my contact information over here. Uh, you can also contact Kelly Parr, who's the project administrator, and we also have a. Brand new web. You know, do you know that emate.com was taken? There's a online dating site. <laughs> uh, you never think of that when you. Yeah, that's true. But but so this this is our website over here, and uh, has information here. There'll be updates here. The slides from today are actually available right over here. So if you go over here, all these slides. Kelly just posted them this morning for me. So these are available right there. You can actually go and watch the slides. And you could have watched me in real time if you wanted to. It's a three-year grant, so we are we just started. Yeah. All, right. all right. Other questions? All right. That's, it's, always, it's usually a good thing or a bad thing when you have no questions. So it either means that, like, you're, uh, yeah, we work with PCs, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Adobe, yeah, Adobe Creative Suite 6 is what we're experimenting with right now. So we're going to be documenting how to use some of that. So it's, it's, it's the, the latest version. It, it probably can, yes. But, but it, it can export to, to these formats. Yes? No, we, we um, not yet. No, I mean, uh, other than some of the schools, uh, uh, Abilene Christian, which uh, you know the students get Apple devices uh, when they start, but um, uh, we haven't seen the problem. We see this as not necessarily a replacement at first for traditional textbooks, as but but again because we're, we're 
our pricing model is anything we develop in-house, we want free. Some authors will want to charge for their materials, but we see this more as a supplement to existing materials rather than as a replacement at first, and that may change originally. Okay. And now you, yeah, so you can see my email now too.